I'll begin with you, Professor. Uh, you've outlined several issues of jurisdiction and, uh, and other legal problems uh, with the ICC that should have precluded uh, the ICC from accepting this non-existent state of uh, Palestine to its membership. As we all know, the prosecutor has already launched a preliminary examination. Could you briefly, briefly walk us through the steps that must be taken from start to finish for an investigation to take place? Does an investigation have to be initiated by the Palestinians against Israel? Can it be initiated by anyone on on behalf of the Palestinians, and also the Palestinians attached a letter asking for an investigation into last summer's Gaza conflict when they signed the Rome Statue. Uh, is it reasonable? Is it a reasonable reading of the legislation to say that when the Palestinians submitted this letter, they initiated the investigation because the preliminary examination is the start of the process, and that cutting off the PA's funds would be consistent with the intent of the legislation. Also, the administration's diplomatic efforts have clearly not been effective in preventing Abu Mazen's actions at the UN and at the ICC. So I ask our panelists, is there a better way that we can be leveraging our assistance, perhaps not to the Palestinians themselves, but to the international allies of the Palestinians or, or at the UN? Professor, we'll begin with you about how the what kicks in the. Uh, okay, so the Palestinians submitted letters of accession to the Rome Statue, joining the Rome Statue, which is purely prospective. They also submitted with that a 12-3 declaration. Uh, a 12-3 declaration is a mechanism to give the court retroactive jurisdiction going back over particular incidents, and they did this back to the, the Gaza War after the three boys were, uh, were kidnapped and killed. When a country joins the ICC, uh, any country can demand, can refer a situation to the prosecutor. It doesn't have to be the countries involved. Any other member country can do so. Uh, now, only the prosecutor actually does the investi uh, investigations, but the process of kicking that off begins with, for example, countries referring such a situation. In the case of the 12-3 declaration, the 12-3 declaration does not require any subsequent follow-up or referral by countries. So it does seem that within the meaning of the uh, existing legislation, the 12-3 declaration, which has resulted in the initial preliminary examination, is the thing that initiated the process. Now, the current legislation speaks, uh, existing legislation speaks of the, uh, uh, the Palestinians initiating a judicially authorized investigation. So there's two parts of that to parse, initiating, and judicially authorized. Now, clearly the steps they've taken can count as initiating. Obviously, the Palestinians themselves don't work at the ICC, so they can't be the ones to actually sign off on the investigation. And if it actually means opening an investigation at the ICC, it would be reading the legislation to be meaningless if it would require the Palestinians doing that, since they can't do that because they're not part of the ICC. Uh, the question of a judicially authorized investigation is a separate question, because after the prosecutor uh, conducts, uh, uh, completes her preliminary examination, which involves questions like jurisdiction, just a very basic questions, is there anything to think about here, uh, she can then go to the pretrial chamber, a body of the ICC, and ask them for authorization to, uh, to open an investigation. The statute could be read to think that that's what actually triggers the aid cutoff, because that's what a judicially authorized investigation is. But it's already been initiated. You, it's consistent with the intent of the legislation to say that the first step of this process is what is going to initiate it, and that step has indeed been taken. However, there are other steps that can be taken against uh, about funding uh, under existing legislation. Uh, if I may uh, briefly, uh, if I may briefly add, uh, existing statutes provide no funds authorized to be appropriated under uh, this or any act shall be available for the United Nations or any specialized agency which accords the PLO the same standing as member states. Now, it's important to point out that this statute, unlike other ones, does not speak of membership. It doesn't say if the UN gives membership to the PLO or to the Palestinians, rather if it gives them standing otherwise enjoyed by member states. To just cut you off there a second, just because I, I know you didn't finish your thought, but what about leveraging our assistance? What is the, the panelist's view about how we should do that, if we should change or not? 
Madam Chairman, Madam Chairman, I, I would say that there are a few areas that I think are worth visiting uh, in terms of the funds that we prov provide the PA. One is, look, we, we should, if as much as the foreign ministry within the PA pursues the, these activities at the ICC and at the UN, we should make sure that whatever allocations are cut off immediately. The same, I would say, would go for the presidential office. There is a slush fund that Mahmoud Abbas uses uh, to pursue these aims, and I think we could we could earmark those funds and cut them. Any uh, area of the PA that is influenced by the PLO decision making, also we should uh, can, uh, we should cut off. I mean, basically, what we're talking about is conditioning our aid, which is something that we have not done. It's, we basically need to demand good governance on the part of the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority itself, though, I should note, is not the problem. They are basically a bureaucratic, functionary government that's making sure that sewage and electricity and water flows. We are really concerned here with the decision-making of a few cronies of Mahmoud Abbas within the PLO and the Fatah faction. They should be the target of any subsequent uh, investigation. Thank you so much. And just an, 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 one minute, Ms. Pletka and Mr. Mikowski. Um, there's no question we need to we need to be careful not to cut off our nose to spite our faces in terms of aid to the Palestinians. And, and there are important parts of that assistance that go to the Palestinian people and that don't go to that don't go to security assistance that again would 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 cause more problems. But I want to highlight something I left out from my testimony very fast. If you could make it quick because it, we messed up on the you. clock, so I, I'm probably I'm, out of time. But you're 30 I'm seconds. Read you, I'm going to read you a, a half a sentence from what what AID reported to CRS is what, the, uh, what a lot of the aid is used for. It goes to the PA toward paying off its commercial debt. Direct budget support will be used in the same manner as previous transfers to service debt to commercial suppliers and commercial banks. You realize that aid to the Palestinians is going to pay off their commercial debts, that they are, that they are making all those choices on their own? Uh, that can't happen. Point taken. Thank you so much. Mr. Deutsch is recognized.